Welcome to the Basics of Podcasting. My name is Dr. Soldier, uh, but you can call me Kashana or Shauna uh, for the purposes of this class. And I'm really excited to talk about the basics of podcasting. So today we will have a short listening exercise that'll pretty much replicate what we'll learn in session two, which is up to three different tracks, almost four um, of different audio files. Next, we'll talk a bit about selecting a format for the podcast. Then we'll talk about script writing and then interview preparation and we'll close uh, with preparation for our next session. So there are a bunch of steps uh, to creating a podcast. I know they sound really amazing uh, when you're listening to them, but it takes a lot of work to get them to their final polished product. So in this session, we'll really be focusing on choosing the right topic for your podcast. Then after you choose this topic, deciding on what kind of format would you like to have for the series? Then we'll pick a title and writing a description and I'll show you an example of one that we've successfully done and that you can listen to on ypl.org. Then we'll talk a bit about selecting your podcast artwork and music and where you can find some of those resources. And we'll close with talking about what kind of equipment do you need to get started, if any. Uh, there's some technical equipment, but then there's also stuff that you already have, I'm sure of it uh, at home. And then we'll close with our intern uh, who's joined us today. And we'll talk a bit about selecting uh, interview par participants, but then also live or pre recorded audio. And I really hope that you join us next week, which will be super hands on and interactive, when we'll actually practice uh, recording your own episode, editing that podcast, and finally posting it on a hosting platform. So, to my favorite part, selecting a format for your podcast. These are kind of the top. Uh, formatting options uh, for podcasts. And I've seen some people stick to one particular format, but then also sort of move in between different types. So the first is the monologue. Uh, if you're an expert uh, like myself, I'm a historian, so I have a lot to say about uh, one topic. Uh, this would definitely be the choice for you. Uh, the monologue podcast can be really exciting, especially if you really enjoy what you're talking about. Um, here it says comedians produce it, but I would say also experts and scholars really like it uh, because you can really deep dive into one particular field over a series or a couple of episodes. The next is interview format uh, where the host kind of invites folks into the podcast series and they post questions or they have a prompt that they'll be discussing with their guests. Um, sometimes they're experts, sometimes they're local citizens, especially if you really are really interested in digging into, for example, community politics or local government. Uh, especially if you're exploring a new topic, this is a great one for you because then you can bring in all different types of experts to really get that information that you wanna share with the world. Um, next is narrative. And that combines the interview and monologue formats and really sort of weaves together, but it really tells a story over a series of episodes. This is actually one of the most popular ones to have, uh, especially since COVID kind of took over the world. A lot of people have been gravitating toward the narrative format because you're able to sort of have a script, but you're also able to have interviews that can bring an additional layer uh, to the story that you're telling. Another, which is really hard to do really well, is the multi-host format. That's if you have a lot of different topics and you wanna bounce in between stories, this is really popular, for example, with sports, for example. Uh, if you like basketball, if you like football, having different commentators who sort of have really good understanding of what's happening, this is a really great format for that. The one thing to be careful about is getting hosts to pop in and pop out. It can be really difficult if you can't replace that person because then suddenly you have to change your format all over again. Uh, the next is the round table format. And it's similar uh, to sort of interviewing, but what I would say is having that expert sort of guide you through or keeping track of a particular topic is really great to have and it will keep the show kind of rolling. And then last but not least, you have the documentary style and that includes both a narrative, but then also behind the scenes look uh, 
And later on in this uh, workshop, I will give you a really good uh, podcast that really has this sort of documentary lens in their bonus episodes. All right, selecting a title and description. It is really hard to do, especially if you wanna be witty, pithy, and to the point. Uh, a lot of great names have already been taken. So here's some general advice, and then I'll talk through an example to the right. So on the left, I just have some tips about selecting a title and description. A great podcast name really should be creative. It should be something that somebody can remember or at least closely remember. Uh, some people recommend having it short, other people like alliteration, like the one to your right on the side where there are three Cs. So someone might not remember it, but they remember a hook part of it is what I recommend. And once you picked a name, it's pretty popular. Um, I recommend Googling the name just to make sure that you're not repeating what someone else is doing because you definitely can get into a little bit of trouble if somebody has already taken that name. Um, and then also a great description is really important, especially if you plan on sharing the podcast with sort of the larger internet world. You want to make sure that your description is tells what the podcast is about, but kind of draws the person in so they know what they're signing up for. Uh, and then finally, for those who love social media and want to have keywords, it's really important, but try not to sort of stuff it full of a bunch of hashtags because then people get a little lost. So making sure you have a keyword here or there is really important. Uh, so if you look to the right side of the screen, here's an example of a title and the description. So histories of change, continuity, and community youngers. Right? So within that description, we already know what it's going to be about, history, we know the location, and then in the description, it says it's hosted by Sarah Lawrence College students. Right? So we know who that target audience is and what they're doing. They're interviewing various community members to understand what's happening uh, in the city of Yonkers, whether it's places, ideas, but also kind of community, how it's shaping the city. Right? So in that really short description, we know who's hosting it, we know what it's about, and we know what to expect for most episodes. And then I also included a description on the bottom. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, in the next slide or two. But promotion, right? After you have this really great podcast, you have to sell it, right? So one of the things that's going to be really important is having sort of a pitch for social media. So this one, as you can see, is a little bit longer. And this is really suited for a blog post. But if you're thinking about, for example, Twitter or Instagram, it should be a little bit shorter, but you do have the opportunity to use those hashtags. So one thing that I really recommend is for your social media, look for keywords that will get people interested. So this one uses Westchester's hippest city, for example, right? So you're gonna get a certain target audience, but you also will gonna have sort of this cross-generational experience with the city of gracious living, right? So understanding who you want to speak to and how you can use as many keywords as possible without being too cliche, right? And then always making sure that you close on where people can listen to the podcast. So for this particular example, with histories of change, continuity and community yonkers, it can be found on the archive ypl.org. All right. Uh, one of my favorite parts, and probably the reason why you're all here, a listening exercise. So I chose this particular uh, podcast because it's pretty timely and it also sort of works to debunk a lot of myths uh, about, for example, women's rights. Last year was the bicentennial anniversary and this particular podcast was produced by Humanities New York. Uh, and it has a combination of a few of the different um, formats that I discussed. The one that we're gonna be listening to is gonna be a blend between narrative and interview. And I thought it was a really good short kind of model to discuss what we're gonna be doing in session two, right? Which is understanding the layers to building a podcast. For example, you're gonna have the host voice, which is one layer, and then you're gonna have your own music uh, and other ways to promote it, but finally interview. Uh, so this particular excerpt is from the first episode, which is introducing the concept of amended, but also this idea that what we might understand historically was the significance of the suffrage movement. We have a long way to go. So I'm going to play it. And on your right, you'll see a few different options for listening uh, exercises. So please feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, use of interview. 
uh, listen to the music. When does the music come in and out? Uh, but then also where is this interview placed and how is it impacting the story that's being told? These are all really key things that if you're deciding to have this kind of format, you're gonna have to answer. And I kind of like uh, their music. So it could be inspirational for you. When we hear the same stories about history over and over again, they can feel like the only truth or seem like they're the whole truth. One story that's being told a lot, especially in 2020, is about the suffrage movement, the fight for women's right to vote in America. The most common version of that history goes something like this. Before the 1840s, American women did not have the right to vote. So a few bold white ladies started a movement to change that. The story tells us that they led the charge until they achieved victory in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified. From then on, we're told, all women in this country could vote. I'm Laura Free, and this is Amended, a podcast from Humanities New York. Like a lot of white people, I grew up hearing that version of the story. But the problem with that story is, it makes white women the only important suffrage activists. And it makes us think they secured voting rights for all women. We find ourselves in a dilemma now in 2020. How do you tell that story and that history? My guests on the show are fellow historians and scholars who will tell us how diverse and complex women's rights history really was. Great. Well, that was a brief excerpt from the podcast Amended. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about it is if you listened, they didn't introduce who that person was that they had interviewed. So you have no idea who that person is, but you're able to distinguish their voice. Right? So one of the purposes, and we'll have another listening exercise later on uh, with Charlie, but one of the things to really consider right, is your formatting. Do you want to introduce the person that you're interviewing up front? Do you want to wait and let it be a surprise? Right? These are all different things to consider as you're designing what you want to be your podcast. Right? Another thing that I really, really like is the person's voice. Uh, I think that your voice can really be distinctive and a lot of podcasts you remember because of that tone of voice. And then lastly, as you can see, there's some captions. So one of the things that is really important for people to consider, especially now, is accessibility and ways in which people can have different experiences. So one of the things that I personally encourage is, I know it's hard to transcribe huge portions of interviews and podcasting, but even having shorter descriptions can be really, really helpful for making sure that things are accessible to as many people as possible. Okay, so some basics for building your podcast. I've gotten a lot of questions about what is the ideal length, right? It can vary and it really depends on your topic and the format. So for example, if you're having a multi-host format that we discussed, a 15 minute podcast is not gonna work, right? It's gonna be really short and confusing, right? But if you have this sort of documentary approach and it's an hour long, that can be boring, right? So you sort of need to find your sort of, I would say sweet spot for how you wanna tell your story and at what pace do you wanna tell the story? Uh, so another thing to decide is, do you want to have a singular sort of uh, episode or do you want to have a series of episodes? And that can also be a factor uh, in how many times you record, but then also how long it is. So most podcasts range really between 30 to 45 minutes. And most podcasts, especially if they're in a series, can have anywhere between three upwards uh, to hundreds. So it's really a personal decision or if you're working with other people, a collaborative decision about how long you want it to be, but then also the frequency. So one of the things that is really important, especially if you wanna establish a audience is to be really consistent with how many times you post, right? So most people look forward, I'm sure to hearing this next podcast, right? So deciding if you wanna post once a week, it's a lot of work, right? So the ideal for most people is really every two weeks. And that gives folks enough time to listen to it, hopefully multiple times, and then prepare for the next episode uh, that would be about a week out after. Another thing to consider would be podcast art or episode art. I, for one, kind of like having both, right? So you have your sort of signature podcast art that has the name, the title of the podcast itself, but another way to increase branding is episode art. And later on in the presentation, I'll talk about ways to help you build 
that episode art, but it can be really great, especially for things like Twitter and Instagram or even TikTok, right? To have a piece that talks specifically about what you're gonna be talking about in that podcast episode. Another is theme music and next week, uh, I'll definitely be introducing you to a few sources where you can get royalty free music so you don't get any legal trouble, which is really key. Uh, but then another thing to consider, of course, is social media strategy, whether you want to have a blog that keeps track of all the podcasts, whether it's a personal website uh, that you'll be posting on or Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of them have different models and you really will have to sort of tweak your message for each of those platforms to get the target audience you're looking for. So rough outline of an episode is typically a welcome that you just heard, setting the scene, providing context, and then you're either topic or learning segments depending on what exactly you're talking about. My favorite is a call to action. I know it sounds super serious, like you're gonna go out there and march, but it really can be as simple as check out next week's episode, this is what it'll be about. It's a way to sort of close your episode and give listeners something to do after, right? So it's sort of this active way to end uh, a podcast. And then finally, your outro, which can be music and of course, a thank you. And that can be to whoever you interviewed or to sponsors if you end up having sponsors that join on. Okay, on to screenwriting, which is my favorite uh, part uh, because it has a lot of flexibility. So I am going to sort of talk about the general podcast script outline and then give you a few options for how you want to scaffold your own writing. So this is a pretty general outline that includes sort of your introduction, a jingle or an intro, and then a longer explanation of what's in store. And then typically for podcasts that are between 15 to 45 minutes, you're going to have a few topics. This one just has two. Uh, and then sort of a segue. Sometimes the segue can be music. Other times it can be a pre-recorded interview. And then having your outro, your call to action, and your music. Now I'm going to talk about types of script writing styles. The first is freestyle, which is really just bullet points. I, for one, don't work well without having a bit of structure. But for those who know a lot about a topic and if you're really comfortable, this can be really great uh, to sort of just have a general conversation and welcome all different types of folks into the conversation. The tricky part is because there isn't as much structure, you could forget things, you could kind of ramble on for longer and lose people, um, or you could get sidetracked or they could get sidetracked because you don't really have sort of a structure that's leading you through the rest. So I would say for those who are super comfortable in their communication skills, this is a good one, but there are some sort of detractors to doing that. Next is the most difficult, and that is word for word script where everything that you are reading has been written. So below I sort of give a structure, even down to how long you wanna talk, right? So if you have a musical intro, this one even tells you, for example, if you wanna have 15 seconds of music, or if you wanna sort of set your first topic and you wanna to talk exactly for 15 minutes, you literally can time every section of it if you're doing a word for word script. The difficult thing is it takes a lot of time to write everything out that you wanna say, uh, but for those who kind of feel uncomfortable with going off script, this can be really helpful. The one thing that I would really strongly suggest is that sometimes when you're reading something over and over, you don't sound like yourself. You kind of sound like a robot, right? So trying to make it sound natural, finding ways to add emphasis or your own laughter or just a piece of you, right? Making it human is really key for this particular type of script writing. Another is the solo format. I particularly like this one because it gives you a bit of flexibility. So it gives you the structure, for example, of two topics and timing, but it also lets you kind of go off script a little bit because then you can add some bullet points and make it a bit more conversational and not just stick to your notes. But when you're about to get sidetracked, you also can keep an eye on time, for example, with the duration that you want to spend, for example, on topic two. Okay. So a big part of podcasting is having some scripted responses because it actually is a thing that most people will begin to remember. If you think about some of your favorite podcasts, you kind of remember how the opening starts. 
right? You remember the voice, you remember what they might talk about, but also some ideas about how to respond to that. So I provided some examples, for example, with the show introduction, welcome to X podcast name, a show that talks about whatever it is, I'm the host name, and then talk about the topic, but also a surprise guest, right? So here's a few different options for you if you're feeling a little bit stuck and you just want a little bit of structure to begin uh, the process with script writing. So that includes guest introductions, the outro. So for example, make sure to check out ypl.org if you haven't heard already to hear more about the history and life about Yonkers, right? And then for call to action, thank you for, for listening to history of continuity community in Yonkers. Before you go, let us know what you think. Uh, and this could be a really great way to plug your own website or social media platforms to get that response from people who are listening. And here, uh, I won't spend too much time, is something that I built out for somebody who really loves a word for word script. Uh, this is an example of the particular length is about a minute if you don't speed read through it. But the reason why I wrote this is to give you an example of what looks like can be really short. If you've been practicing a lot, you can speed up and talk really fast like this and lose the listener. So one of the things that I really recommend if you have a script is to practice a bit and make sure that you're going slow enough that people who are listening for the first time can really get engaged with the work. So this particular introduction is about a minute if I speak slowly, but it also outlines what the listener is in for as far as the episode itself, right? So it says who the host is, you give where they're from, their expertise, but then also what the show is about. And this one that I wrote is about Tibbet Park. And it also talks about who you'll meet, right? So that can be another really important sort of calling card for talking about the episode. And then some highlights and keywords. So this particular one talks about the infamous desegregation case, right? But also this idea that the whole theme of the podcast is meeting people in a park, which I think is actually pretty cool, right? And the different conversations that you can have with neighbors um, in this particular location. This slide is pretty in depth, uh, but it gives you an idea of what to expect when you're setting the context for your podcast, right? So if you're giving, for example, a historical podcast, you wanna actually sort of trace out that history in a pretty linear way, right? Because most people are listening to you because you have some sort of expertise. So this is really your moment to shine is what I would say to lay out whatever the story that you're telling and give it some structure. So in this particular one, I outline a context talking about all the way back to 1985 with Fair Housing Act, right? And this idea of how the case was supposed to unfold. Ultimately, it didn't, uh, but I thought it was a really good example to sort of show what people thought would happen and then contrast that with the interviews that talk about people's real life experience. And having that juxtaposition, I think, is actually really exciting for listeners. Okay. On to my favorite, uh, interviewing. So those who are super enthusiastic and bubbly like me, I love interviewing uh, because it's your one opportunity to really get to know somebody new, but to also give them a platform to engage and work. So here are some things that I recommend for preparing for your interview. Identify who it is that you wanna interview. And that can either be through your own sort of social network or community itself, or reaching out to somebody who you think would be really interesting for your podcast. Next, making sure that you obtain consent uh, because some podcasts are free, others because of promotion are paid. So you do wanna make sure that there is some sort of consent that someone who's coming onto your podcast knows what they're signing up for. And then before the interview, making sure you test out your audio and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but then also preparing for the interview. You never wanna go in without any preparation. So having some sort of a little bit of generalist of questions or topics are really important. I recommend doing a little bit of research about the person in addition to the topic so that you're able to sort of introduce them in a way that really makes them feel special or different or an expert. Uh, so you actually get that energy back because people are listening and they can hear if somebody is a bit disconnected is what I would say. Uh, and then for those who are really interested in, for example, genealogy and are working with a sort of older demographic, having memory clues like old photos or heirlooms or scrapbooks 
are really exciting because you'll get someone's sort of genuine and honest reaction by using some of these things to sort of jog their memory. All right, a few more things. So at the time of the interview, be sure to explain why you're doing this. And I really recommend starting off with really simple questions that really get into a person's background so they become comfortable before you start tackling those harder topics. Uh, and then also listen carefully, be prepared to ask follow-up questions. And then after, I really recommend reviewing the names and places so that you can make sure that everything is spelled correctly and proper recognition is given. It will save you a lot of headaches to make sure that you got all the proper information from the person at the time of the interview. And then also you're gonna explain the importance of the consent form that I'll talk about briefly. And like I mentioned, uh, to decide whether or not you wanna transcribe your work. If you look at a lot of podcasts that are really popular, there are transcriptions. And that's really to consider accessibility and who is listening. So some people might be reading it, some people might be listening. And that's a personal choice. But I personally recommend it uh, just because you're able to sort of have the largest audience as possible engaging with your work. All right, some recommendations for consent forms. I think these are pretty basic and standard, but you do want to have the person's name, uh, contact information, age of consent, at least 18. If you are interested in interviewing folks who are under the age of 18, you should make sure that a parent, a guardian, or adult is signing on behalf of them. And here are some major points uh, that I think consent forms should follow, but there definitely are plenty of uh, templates that if you want to Google, it's your friend uh, to consider how you want to tweak it. So making sure that you address to share, that you want to share the interview, but any images, but also that there are going to be multiple uses for the interview. So that's going to be the audio recording, the transcript, the audio clip itself, but then photographs and any social media posts. So if you do want to tag that person or tag a business, this is where you would cover that. And then making sure that the person understands that the work is being distributed to the public. And then finally, liability, making sure that the person once they sign over is aware uh, that you are not responsible for anything that happens afterward. Uh, and then lastly, that no compensation is um, being provided to share these stories and a signature. So pretty basic, but it definitely will cover all of the basis for at least a basic podcast without sponsorships. If you do have sponsorships, that's a whole other topic, but you can email me and we can talk more about how to tweak your consent form to take that into consideration. Uh, we'll talk a bit more uh, with Charlie's presentation about how you decide to find uh, interview participants, but I have some general takeaways. So defining your project, right? You wanna make sure that you can explain your project to get others involved, right? You don't wanna be unenthusiastic or not knowledgeable because then people will begin to question who you are. So making sure you have a strong pitch is really key. Um, another thing to consider is interview bias, right? Everybody comes into you know, an interview with their own beliefs, assumptions, and values. And the cool thing about podcasts is you don't have to be neutral. You don't have to be a journalist. You don't have to have a position, but being really clear about your position and understanding how that position may impact your interview is really, really important. Uh, and then another thing to consider is select narratives who are willing and able to be interviewed, right? So having that initial conversation with them and understanding what questions they might not prefer to answer, or ones that they're really enthusiastic about answering is gonna be really, really key, right? To making sure that your message gets across in a palatable way, right? You don't wanna turn off the person who you're interviewing uh, before the project even gets going. Uh, and then finally, making sure that you ask permission, have your consent form, and set a time are all really important things. And then some just general takeaways. I recommend setting aside at least two hours uh, for the interview. And that can be everything from setting up equipment. It can be waiting for the person, reviewing your notes to actually conducting the interview and then making sure that you're saving and backing up all of your information. Uh, when you set up your recording equipment, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Make sure it's in a really, really quiet place. Make sure that you test it out at the time before you do the interview. Uh, because if there is, if you live next to a fire station or if you know that you live next to a school and school lets out around three and it gets really noisy, that may appear in your recordings and you definitely want to avoid that. 
Um, make sure that you slate your recording, especially if you prefer to do pre-recorded interviews. And then lastly, uh, for those who are really interested in sort of autobiographical interviews, make sure that you're thinking about things to sort of discuss. So birthplace, date of birth, and other context that you can provide in the case that you want to edit out some of the responses. You have enough, right, just to get going. And then some final ones, make sure that you're sort of finding that balance, right, between allowing people to discuss their experiences, but then also really key questions that will frame the podcast itself. Um, listen carefully, and then sort of clarify if things are a little bit unclear, just so you can follow up and fill in any gaps. And then most importantly, I really cannot stress this enough, try to avoid sort of leading or traditional questions just because it might not work. So leaning towards open-ended questions or a list of alternative answers can be really great. Another thing to consider for the social media promotion part is taking photos, right? Especially if this is a person that has a little bit of a fan base or recognition, having their photo attached to your promotion can be really important. And some things to consider, you can either take the photo yourself or most people prefer to submit their own photos, which makes your life even easier. But I did wanna include uh, some options for those people who sort of wanna take the photo on the spot so just thinking about the background, uh, but also a few images that just sort of display whatever it is that you wanna discuss during the podcast. Tackling hard topics, especially if you're choosing to have a certain kind of bent or lean for your podcast, it can be something that keeps you up at night, uh, deciding what you can and cannot say or not knowing, right? What the person you're interviewing may or may not say. So it's really important to sort of arrange your podcast questions in a way that you oftentimes leave the sort of challenging questions toward the end when someone has sort of warmed up to you as a person and kind of can respect what you're doing. And it makes it a lot easier than starting off with your most difficult question at the beginning. Uh, so one of the things that I think works really well if you're choosing the interview style is to start with a broad question, right? That can allow the person to sort of talk about a full range of experiences. Uh, and then just keeping an eye, for example, on body language. If someone seems enthusiastic, they might smile more, they might laugh. If they're uncomfortable or unwilling uh, to answer the question, they can become a bit more reserved. And that's why it's really important to have an initial conversation with the person, whether it's live or pre recorded, uh, to know what they are willing or not willing to discuss. Great. And then just some general tips for a successful interview, make sure that you're respectful, even if you disagree with the person. Sometimes I think some of the most interesting podcasts can be polemical in the way that people kind of want somebody with a different opinion, but depending on how that goes, it can either be a positive or a negative experience. So being respectful definitely helps sort of make sure that it goes well. Um, avoid interrupting the narrator if they kind of seem like they're going on a tangent. I would say look for a place where you have a sort of breath or the person's taking a pause and then redirect the conversation back to the topic at hand. Making sure that you thank the person is always a great thing to do. Uh, and then finally, allow the person to ask you questions. That's a great way to build trust. All right, uh, to recording audio, we'll spend a lot more time on this in our second session, but I did wanna prep a little bit to talk about ways in which are the best ways to record that audio. So I'm giving two options. Both work really well for podcasting. The first can be literally your phone, your smartphone. It does a great job recording audio. Um, and it has things like voice memo. If you have an Android, you have the same thing, an audio recorder. Or you can download uh, Easy Voice Recorder for those interviews if you want to pre-record them. The same thing is true of Zoom. Um, I've listed a screenshot here, and this is where you can record a separate audio file, and that's the one that you can work with and not even need to turn on the video. So those are two different options for pre-recording interviews. Uh, next week when we do the editing tutorial, I can also talk through a live recording um, of interviews. Some things to keep in mind, your microphone, either in your phone or your laptop or your microphone, picks up all noises, good and bad. And typically you don't hear them until you're listening back to the file and you hear that random siren and other things. 
And some noises can be edited out, others may not. So it's a really good idea to make sure that you have a really quiet place that you've set up. And I have this really cool slide where I talk about do-it-yourself audio studios. Uh, so you can talk about ways to sort of mute that noise too. But there are some really infamous and unfortunate noises that we hear all the time. It can be your, someone's on the phone behind you. It can be other voices in the next room. If someone's in the restroom or emergency vehicles, or if the room is empty, it can echo. And that's really hard to edit out. So testing out your equipment is really important. Um, and I've included some typical pitfalls. If you're by a window, not a good idea because if something drives by really loud, you're gonna pick up that noise. So finding a quiet location is really key. All right, to my favorite part about equipment. Some equipment you can buy, it really depends on if you want this podcast to sort of be at a professional level where this is your job, or if you wanna use what you have and you still can get really great quality. Right, so if you look on that left picture, this is a microphone, uh, you can buy it off Amazon, it's a set, so you can attach the arm to, for example, your desk. And this is an external microphone, so your, your sound will be really, really crisp. It's about $60 for that set. Uh, next is your laptop, you have a built-in microphone that works really well, so you don't need to go out and buy a microphone if you're not sort of committed to uh, that kind of price point. Uh, but one thing that I do really recommend, if you look at this picture right here, is an external hard drive. Audio files take up a decent amount of space. So I'll discuss some ways that you can save to the cloud. But if you're like me and want to save things six times, an external hard drive can be really good. Uh, and then lastly, the picture on the right, headphones, uh, can be really great for playback and then also editing your podcast. You can hear any, even the smallest noise, you can hear a lot better if you're using headphones. Okay, to do it yourself recording studios. I thought these pictures were both comical, but also practical, right? Sometimes you don't wanna go in and build a $300 studio, but you do have things at home that can definitely muffle the noise uh, as you're recording. So if you look at a bunch of the pictures, this one over here, person's in their closet, really tight space so things won't echo, you know, get a really decent sound quality because it's a confined space. I don't recommend the blanket over you. It's pretty hot in the summer, not comfortable. You might be there for a while. Uh, and then this one in the middle, I think is interesting. The person took a box and put some foam to kind of have that sound boxed in a little bit more. Uh, and then the least successful is to the right with the pillows. It's okay, it's not gonna get the job done per se because your fort could fall <laughs> and then it's loud again. Uh, so I personally recommend uh, finding a confined space like a closet if you have the room, but then also sort of building that box, right? Where you can add a little bit of foam, add some cushion and make sure that that sound is pretty confined uh, and you are the dominant voice and not external noises. All right, and then lastly, where to store your audio files? There are two different types of audio files and we'll talk a bit more about this next week when we start editing and using Audacity, but you have WAVE and MP3 files and the difference sounds complex, but it's pretty simple. The MP3 is compressed, so it means that it's going through an editing process and it's a final project where the WAVE is uncompressed, uh, the opposite. So you're actually able to manipulate it a little bit. And we'll talk more about the way to do that. I have a link here that shows you how to switch between an MP3 and a wave or an MP4 and a wave. Uh, and we'll definitely talk more extensively about this next week when we get to actually recording and editing the audio uh, for the interactive session. And then just some recommendations for safe storage. I save three different places because I'm paranoid I might lose something. Uh, so I have an external hard drive, but then also I save to cloud. So Google Drive is a great place. Uh, Microsoft Outlook Drive is a great place. Dropbox, if you have it. And then, like I said, a hard drive. So these are all great places to store your audio files. And in preparation for our editing session next week, I really recommend those who are joining us next week to download Audacity. It's a free audio editing program that we'll be using for the purposes of the workshop. But then for those who have Apple products, GarageBand is really, really great also 
uh, but Audacity is free and does everything that GarageBand does as well. Uh, so you aren't losing out on anything by downloading Audacity instead of GarageBand. All right, and at this time, I'll be turning things over to Charlie. Hello, I'm Charlie. Um, and I did a pod made a podcast about uh, bookmobiles in Yonkers, um, bookmobiles from the Yonkers Public Library, and I interviewed Eugene Howell as part of it, and I used some um, audio of interviews from the Yonkers Public Library archives. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I did that and how to use the archives or like how to use archives in your podcast if you want to and how to find those to maybe get ideas. Um, so if you go to the YPL website um, and you go to the research tab and then local history and then other under other digital resources, there's the library digital archives and that will bring you to the Yonkers Public Library archives. Um, and there's a ton of interviews that people have done on there and you can search the archives related to your topic. So that was the first step I did when I was interested in bookmobiles. And that way you can help, it can help you find people to interview or reach out to if you don't have a person in mind, like someone that may be knowledgeable or alternatively, it can also connect you um, to people who might know people that want to be interviewed on your podcast or have things to add. Um, yeah, so as I said, if you don't have anyone specific in mind, reaching out to people in fields related to or otherwise connected to your topic. So for instance, mine was on the bookmobiles and Yonkers. And one of the first things I did other than looking at the archives was reaching out to the librarians at the Yonkers Public Library to see if anyone um, wanted to speak to me or knew someone I should speak to. So yeah, and then there is, I think on this slide, there should be a audio clip. And I was gonna start it around 5.05, but maybe not, sorry. <laughs> this is just a little clip of my interview with Eugene. But that was my first book I remember taking. So when did you start working on the mini book mobile? As soon as you started working at the library? Yes, in fact, I was in all I was an office help temp, and uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about how how did the job happen? I was working up like in Harrison, and I didn't have to get up like five thirty in the morning. By the time I got home, it was dark. I, I had to be at work at like six six thirty. And when I said to them, not that I was going to quit, but I said, isn't there anything close by? And then they said, oh, we have just the, the, the right job for you. And it's gonna be a nice long stay, okay? It's gonna last from August until December of the end of the year. And I've been here ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Will was a director of the Yonkers Public Library. And in this interview from the Yonkers Public Archives, he talks about his experience starting the bookmobiles, their cost, what they looked like, and how they evolved. And one bookmobile, which was made from a post office to buy from four truck, the sides is opened up on the outside. I'm going inside except to store books. And the public would get the books from the outside shelves as the sides were opened up, take them to the tailgate and charge them out or return them there. That was the first book that was started in 1931. So that's why I had when I came here and the whole operating cost, as I remember, was about $307,000. You know, retired, it was something over $2 million. <laughs> What was your favorite part of working in the bookmobile? At the time, let's remember now, all the Star Trek adventures and um, um, Star Wars and all that was coming out. So it was like, I'm traveling, I'm traveling all over the city. I had, 
as one summer job I've worked, actually two, I worked for the Department of Public Works or the Engineering Department. And I grew up from the time I was nine until I was in my forties, I lived in this area. And when I started in, in City Hall, they said, now you're gonna go and see what the real Yonkers looks like because you're thinking this quadrant which has mostly minorities. And it's actually, it's more reflective of New York City than any of the other parts of Yonkers. And so I got to see how the other, the upper half lives or the rich, okay. So again, the bookmobile was like I was in Lost in Space or what have you. I'm going from places I've never met before, people who didn't look like me or what have you, and then what their interests were. So that was the perfect job for somebody in their 20s, okay, you, you, it, it couldn't have been better. I wish people who were in their 20s had, <laughs> had, had a job like that, but it was especially on the mini mobile, which I gave you that information about yeah. that. The mini mobile was the beginning of what you would think a library would be. So you got to do video but it was with the old fashioned cameras, you know, like, like yeah. this big a, a thing or what have you, we got to play. Yeah, so that was just a little clip of the podcast. And um, so as you can see in there, I kind of leave some different interviews I did with one with Eugene and then the other with Mr. Will I took from the archives. So that's why the audio sounded different was it was an older recording. <laughs> um, and I think one thing that you, so when you're creating the podcast, like one thing to keep in mind is that interviewees may have materials to share with you. So Eugene brought some materials when he was meeting with me that we talked about and that I used actually. Um, one was an essay written by a girl about the bookmobiles. And I used that later in the podcast. I read, I read a portion of it as part of um, kind of narrative material. And then at the end of the podcast, I wrapped up with some statistics on the book reveals that I got um, from some archived material that um, Eugene uh, provided me with. So there's just, um, you, you should be re prepared as well, but also the interviewee may have things to share with you um, that could really add to your podcast. Um, and yeah, bring materials of your own to help jumpstart the conversation. Um, and come prepared for questions, but also let the interviewee kind of talk about what interests them in connection with your topic. And if new questions come up as the interview unfolds, that's okay. Like when I was interviewing Eugene, he was talking about comparing, he was comparing the um, bookmobiles to the ice cream trucks. Um, and so when I had, when there was a next pause in the conversation, I asked him, because I was just thinking of this, I was like, so what was better, the ice cream truck or the bookmobiles? And he said the bookmobiles. So, you know, sometimes things just kind of come up that you had a, you have a set list of questions, but um, the conversation may go in different directions or questions off of other questions. Um, and then when you're putting together your podcast, what I did essentially was gather all the information I had. So my interview with Eugene, the interview with Mr. Will, and then the other archive materials that I wanted to use. And I decided what kind of order I wanted to put them in. Um, and then kind of my script was, I wrote out my intro that I read word for word and my ending. And then I also wrote out the little in-between bits. Um, but the actual narration from materials or the podcast was more just kind of outlined. So I found like writing an outline of that information and where you want to include what to be really helpful, especially when you get to the editing phase. Yeah. So that's kind of my process. I can't hear you. Okay. Great. So a little bit of homework because this wouldn't be a workshop if you didn't have homework. Uh, so in preparation for our second session, one of the exercises I really recommend everyone try out is building your own studio. And that can be testing out your own space, whether that is a closet or building a box and just finding something 
where you can actually test the sound quality of whatever it is that you want to record. So it could be your voice. It could be your own interview with a friend or a family member just to see what it sounds like. Uh, and then finally, downloading Audacity or GarageBand because next week will be all interactive. So we will both show you, Charlie and myself, how to record yourself, how to record others, how to edit it all together, uh, and then finally, how to post. So a little bit of homework that hopefully should be fun uh, for the class. And remember, next week, this time, uh, it'll be the tutorial where you'll learn how to edit and then upload. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me at ksoldier at ypl.org. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you next week where we'll get to start editing and you will get to start working on your own podcast. <laughs>